What are you all doing on my terrace? The show's starting. Hi, I'm Barry Mitchell. Welcome to Simply Science. As you can see, we're still working from home, and I don't know what day, month, or year it is. But on with the show. Did you know copper is the oldest metal used by humans? Copper also kills or inhibits the growth of microorganisms and bacteria. Can this common metal help us in our battle against COVID-19 and other diseases? Here's Donna Hanover. Copper alloy surfaces kill bacteria. They destroy viruses. Dr. Harold Michaels is an expert in metals and founder of the Antimicrobial Copper Action Network. He says copper kills deadly bacteria like E. coli and MRSA. What do you really passionately want people to know about copper? Copper can help make you safe. Copper protects. Harold's wife and partner in some of their work is Dr. Corinne Michaels, a celebrated genetics professor emerita at Queens College. She explains how bacteria die when they land on a copper surface. Copper ions get released. These copper ions catalyze a reaction that forms some hydrogen peroxide. It causes the membrane to be distorted and eventually just burst open and all of the insides of the bacteria are released and the bacteria is dead. And it acts in minutes, literally minutes. She says, as for many viruses that attack us, they invade a human cell, multiply inside it, and take some of that cell's membrane along as they extrude out of the cell. But that membrane can also be destroyed by copper ions. It works against influenza and the very contagious norovirus. Can copper help the world's fight against the coronavirus that causes COVID-19? Harold and Corinne wrote an article to say they believe the answer is yes. It has been tested against against coronavirus, just not this specific coronavirus. I've seen comparisons of the DNA, the one that causes COVID-19 compared to the one that has been tested. They're very closely related. I basically put together an argument saying, if it works on, 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 on this coronavirus, it will work on the one that causes COVID-19. We're talking about the same copper that covers the Statue of Liberty, and yes, it's the same copper that covers our pennies. By the way, copper mixed with nickel covers our other coins. People have known for millennia that copper has health benefits, even when mixed with other metals to form alloys like brass or bronze. People learned that transporting water in copper vessels made it safer to drink. And in the deadly Paris cholera epidemics of the 1860s, most workers who dealt with copper didn't get the disease. Harold says there are many alloys that have copper as the primary metal. In his years with the Copper Development Association, he studied Grand Central Station's brass railings and bronze door pulls, proving that these copper alloys are still killing microbes years after being installed. Experiments at North Shore University Hospital in Manhasset, New York, proved that stethoscopes with copper parts reduced bacteria, and so did copper outfitted phlebotomy chairs for drawing blood. Researchers know that many people die from infections they pick up while in a hospital. So Harold helped run studies funded by the Department of Defense at three hospitals, including Sloan Kettering in New York. We work in the medical intensive care units. We install the copper surfaces in the rooms, the over the patient table, the IV pole, the arms of the visitor chair, the bed rail, Nurses call button, they comprise certainly well less than 10% of the area of the room. But these were things that were frequently touched. It, it showed a dramatic difference. The copper rooms had a 58% fewer infections. A similar study installing copper at a Ronald McDonald house for families of kids getting hospital care reduced bacteria by 80%. The Environmental Protection Agency has even weighed in, confirming the bacteria-fighting benefit of copper alloy surfaces. 
It should be in schools. It should be in mass transit systems. You don't have to train anyone if you're running a facility how to make the copper work. It's going to just do it automatically. Although they are big fans of copper alloy surfaces, the Michaels have some reservations about faddish items that have appeared for sale, like copper-infused socks, masks, and bed sheets. Where's your data? Show me the facts, and then I'll, right. I'll consider it. You know, um, as scientists, that's where it always comes down to. If if you have the facts, you would present them. Of course, copper comes from the earth, and companies that do the mining have been criticized because of damage to the land and groundwater. The way they used to do things, you know, certainly 100 years ago, but even 50 years ago, uh, is not acceptable. And I think they're trying to be responsible. But can you imagine a society where we didn't have any copper? You wouldn't have cell phones. You wouldn't have computers. You'd have, what would you have for wiring in your house? Hopefully it'll be used more in antimicrobial applications to help mankind and uh, prevent infections and save lives. That is the power of copper. I'm Donna Hanover for Simply Science. These days you have to disinfect everything you touch. Can you imagine having to disinfect an entire stadium? Bring on the drones. Bring on Susan Jun. Most consider them toys or cool cameras, but one company is assigning a more important purpose to drones, putting them to work in the fight against COVID-19. Like many businesses, the Buffalo-based company Eagle Hawk saw its operations come to a screeching halt with the outbreak of the pandemic. Being a team of engineers, uh, we thought, you know, hey, how could we contribute with our company? How could we use our skill set, our technology to add value and, and help be part of the solution with the pandemic? So the company, which normally conducts building inspections using drones and thermal cameras, shifted gears to create disinfectant spraying drones designed to clean large venues where sanitizing will be crucial to resuming operations. With the drone technology, we can do it quicker. Uh, we can help him with his turnaround times, uh, reducing the labor force. So now you're not having 30, 40 people carrying around heavy backpack sprayers, which can weigh 40 pounds. And that creates liabilities from you know being exposed to chemicals to, to falling. And the drone tech startup, which won half a million dollars in funding from Genius New York, is not the only company offering drone-enabled disinfectant spraying. However, CEO Patrick Walsh says Eagle Hawk has developed a custom-tailored delivery system, which is more effective than the agricultural drones used by others, which carry the disinfectant on board. So they didn't, one, carry enough liquid on board their tanks, uh, to make it feasible, and then two, they didn't spray it enough volume and pressure to meet the uh, the wet time requirements for a lot of the EPA approved products. Eagle Hawk system leaves the disinfectant chemicals approved by the EPA and New York DEC on the ground and feeds it up to the drones through a hose tethered to another drone. We have the primary drone, which is doing the spraying, like six to eight feet above the seats. It's got a spray boom, and then the hose is coming off. Uh, the bottom of the drone and then the secondary drones just hose, holding that hose up in the air above the seats. So they're kind of working in tandem going up and down the roads. Eagle Hawk has tested its disinfecting drones with major college teams and even some NFL teams. And while the focus has been on sports venues, the technology can be used in any large area. We've built the system to work both indoors and outdoors. Um, we actually use a, a what's called a LiDAR-based sensor that's actually mapping its environment in real time, so it allows us to fly in GPS to nine environments or areas where GPS is very limited. What do you see for the future of drone technology and helping in situations like the pandemic? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the pandemic's put a sense of urgency on, you know, deploying technology like automation and, and unmanned flight beyond visual line of sight an area Walsh says he's eager to explore. For now, Eagle Hawk will continue its inspection work as it also seeks to play a part in the battle against COVID. If we can help be part of the solution, uh, that makes us excited and, and hopefully it turns into a viable business opportunity as well. For Simply Science, I'm Susan Jun. 
A black hole is a place in space where gravity is so strong, nothing can escape, not even light. Or so we thought. Our Vyanara Vinka spoke with two CUNY professors who may have found light in the darkest part of the universe. Very exciting news in the field of astronomy. News that made waves in the mainstream media who called it a tremendous advance for science and the beginning of a new era of astronomy. At the center of it all, our own CUNY researchers, doctors Savik Ford and Barry McKernan, here with us today for a conversation on their findings about the ever fascinating black holes. Welcome both. Thank you. Thank you, Dina. Savik, before we bring more detail into the picture, why is this finding important to the scientific community and to each of us? Uh, Earthlings. So it's really exciting because we think that this is the first time that we may have detected light that you could see with your eyes coming from a black hole merger. And so everybody knows that black holes don't emit any light, but if you embed them in gas, which does emit light, then you can get a light based signal for some events that might happen between black holes. And so we're very excited because we know that there was a merger of two black holes because we detected it in gravitational waves, which is like hearing it, but we weren't able to see it. And now we think that we have an event where we have done both heard it and seen it. And if this is a correct, we'll be able to use it to probe the expansion of the universe and understand more about galaxies and how our universe got to be the way that it is today. Mary, we met just recently at the American Museum of uh, Natural History, where you're both uh, researchers with the astrophysics department. Take us through the chain of discoveries from that moment on. It seems like it all escalated into more and more findings on your end. We basically have been working on this idea, black hole mergers in these gas disks that Savik was talking about, for probably the last 10 years. And just in the last five years or so, LIGO has discovered gravitational waves. And just in the last two years, LIGO started seeing more and more uh, black hole mergers. And so what really happened in just the last six months to year is that people have been paying attention to this particular model that we've been working on and have started looking for the signatures you might expect. And we were all shocked. We didn't think that we would see something first time around, but um, our friend and colleague, Matthew Graham, who led this work, found this really weird event that seemed to match what uh, uh, one of the black hole mergers that LIGO saw. And so we were shocked. <laughs> and try to figure out what we could from, from what we saw. Well, we'll have to end our conversation here. And if I may, with your own words, Barry, quoted by the New York Times, our picture of the universe just became more sophisticated, complicated, but also beautiful. Thank you both for shedding light on the universe. <laughs> Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much for your You find it in pools and ponds. It's algae and a Brooklyn College professor is taking on this problematic plant, helping turn Prospect Park's lakes from green to clean. Here's Andrew Falzone. This is the view from a kayak on the lake at Prospect Park. While it may seem okay to drop a hook and some bait to see what you can catch, fishing is prohibited in the park, and it may be as much about protecting people as it is about conserving fish. That's because there's algae in the water. It makes the water look like green paint, and even worse, the algae is contaminating it. When the algae grow, they release toxins. And it turns out that these particular toxins that these algae produce, are they, they hurt the liver of living organisms. And so when the dogs drink it, it's a, a liver toxin or a hepatotoxin, and so it can make them sick. Dr. Jennifer Cherrier is the chair of the Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences at Brooklyn College. An oceanographer by training, her latest project involves polishing water, which is the process of removing particulate and dissolving materials from the water. 
In this case, Dr. Cherrier's system called EcoWare is targeting phosphorus for removal. In New York City, we have old buildings that have old lead pipes, and it's impossible to remove all the lead pipes in all the old buildings. And so in the early 90s, uh, New York City started adding phosphorus to its drinking water supplies to ensure that lead wouldn't go into the drinking water. As more phosphorus comes in, different types of plants are growing, plants that normally wouldn't grow. So we have these blooms of plants that are growing in Prospect Park Lakes and other lakes in New York City. And that's exactly what algae are, plants. Sometimes you'll find them growing in salt water, sometimes in fresh. Not all algae are toxic, but in this case... Cyanobacteria, the scientific name is microcystis. It's a blue-green algae. Um, some of these plants just grow, and there's a lot of them. When they grow, when they see too much phosphorus, they produce toxins, um, which are harmful to the fish that live there, uh, dogs that might want to go there. Um, to swim in the water because the toxins uh, can make them sick. Another form of algae invading the lake because of all the phosphorus in the water is called duckweed. No, it's not toxic, but can still be dangerous because of how it looks. A friend of mine recently told me that his dog went running towards the water and uh, fell right in because he thought he was going to be walking on grass. Park managers tried other solutions like skimming the algae out of the water. When they heard about Dr. Cherrier's system, they thought it might be just what they needed. Brooklyn College came to us and uh, we just wanted to partner with Brooklyn College. And we thought they're, they're here, they're local, um, they can do the monitoring and we can do it as a nice research project as well instead of buying something else. The system is symbiotic with nature, which means it works with natural processes instead of against them or using potentially harmful chemicals. Before the drinking water, which contains the unwanted phosphorus, is sent to the lake, it gets filtered through a massive sand filter. So where will they put all that sand? Essentially, you could put it underneath all the ball fields in Prospect Park and people will be playing soccer on top of them, baseball on top of them, and would never know that this magic is going on underground except for the fact that Prospect Park doesn't have to water the fields as much, and also it might be, the grass might be a little bit greener because they're always getting this phosphorus. And the grass will continue to absorb the phosphorus because the water will be just below the surface, right near its roots. The public won't notice anything. What they'll notice possibly is, why is this patch of grass greener than the norm other patch of grass? Because we don't fertilize in the park, we don't fertilize at all. So it's all, you know, what you get. So sometimes our lawns don't look the prettiest, but in this area, they probably will look pretty. So if you head through Prospect Park and don't see any algae in the water, just remember there's also a whole lot of science you don't see going on underground. I'm Andrew Falzone for Simply Science. Maybe you've seen variety show performers pretending to be robot comedians, miming their jerky motions and playing for laughs their obliviousness to crowd reaction. Well, now there actually is a robot comedian and it's teaching us about artificial intelligence. I feel good. I met a wonderful doctor. I gave a guy six months to live. Couldn't pay his bill. Gave him another six months. <laughs> Watch out, Henny Youngman, there's a new king of the one-liners. I saw a foxy robot the other night. She was smoking. Naturally, we called tech support right away. <laughs> My autonomous robot comedian will help day-to-day -day robots and virtual assistants be more fun to interact with. Did you hear the one about Dr. Naomi Fitter? She created John the Robo comic, her most recent project in an ongoing quest to make artificial intelligence devices that are more sensitive to picking up and responding to human cues. We've been touring around the West Coast mainly, but also a few other appearances around the world. Are the jokes all pre-recorded? And he draws from that bank of jokes. The robot has all these pre-recorded snippets. Uh, myself and my husband actually have written all of the jokes uh, for the robot to date. What's the difference between a human and a light bulb? Humans require regular meals and sleep. Ha 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 <laughs> But wait, Siri tells jokes. Your current Siri can tell you a joke, but it's a little bit deadpan and not that responsive to how you receive the joke. Why did the spaghetti have to go to bed? It was pasta bedtime. Uh-huh, puns. Yeah. It's what we call dad jokes nowadays. 
Yeah, dad jokes, maybe I laugh or maybe I don't laugh. It waits a fixed amount of time and then it just goes on doing its Siri thing. One thing we wanted is for the robot to be able to have good timing. Ask me, what's the most important thing in comedy? What's the most timing. important thing? And we thought for the robot, we really needed this as well. So the robot actually listens to its surroundings and tries to decide when the audience response is petering out. You can probably tell from looking at me that I'm from the valley. <laughs> Silicon Valley. You can probably tell from looking at me that I'm from the valley. <laughs> Silicon Valley. We're also trying to gauge the audience's sort of laughter level or enthusiasm to decide what the robot says next. These beauty standards are impossible. I'm thinking of getting plastic surgery. You know, where they epoxy more plastic to my exoskeleton. You see, because I am a robot, I'm made of plastic. So any modification to my exterior is plastic surgery. <laughs> okay, so aside from raising a race of superhuman robot comedians, how do you apply what you learn? We're already seeing lots of artificially intelligent agents like your Alexa or your Siri, yes. virtual assistants popping up in day-to-day -day life. And you can imagine that as robots are appearing in these more intimate environments, People will want them to have a personality and character and be able to use humor successfully. Like Rosie from the Don't Jetsons. Rosie, you are worth your weight in leftovers. <laughs> Thank you. And I love you people too. We know a lot about how robots could use audio to inform what they do next, but there's a lot of other signaling that people emit body language, other types of behavior, facial expressions. So in, in next steps, I think it might be important to consider those aspects of human behavior and emotion and use those to inform how the robot's reading the room. Thank you. If you like me, please book me and help me take your jobs. <laughs> A new exhibit at the American Museum of Natural History explores the wonderful world of color. Here's Adam Miller with a first look. This is a show about color and it's a very natural thing for us to be doing here at the museum because color is involved in almost all the research we do here. And what we wanted to do with this show is uh, provide an engaging, fun show that uh, talked about color, explained color, and showed how color has been important. A new exhibit at the American Museum of Natural History called The Nature of Color shows how color plays a role in anthropology, the natural sciences, social sciences, and culture. The exhibition is divided into colored rooms that will uh, talk more about color and natural selection and color and your emotions and uh, how color is made. And the red room is, is what I find to be the most appealing to me because it, it's mostly about culture and it's mostly about how culture influences the way we use color. We humans are the only species on this planet that can think about color, contemplate color, and what color things are and what color things should be. And of course, an exhibit about color has a lot to see but there's also a lot to do. You can play with prisms and projections to see how colors, light, and shadows interact. Learn how colors are made and how color affects your mood. Part of the exhibit features an installation of portraits by Brazilian photographer Angelica Das. Her work showcases the diversity of human skin tones to challenge the socially constructed racial categories and celebrate the beauty and diversity of humans from around the world. The project is called Humani. Basically with this work, I was trying to show how I see my family. Uh, I make portraits in a white background. I choose a square of 11 pixels from the nose. I paint the background and I look for the corresponding color in an industrial palette called Pantone, trying to search for the black and white that are these colors that are associated with the concept of race that of course don't apply to human beings as we are 99.9% equal. Through photographs, Angelica shows us that we are a mix of colors, shades, and hues. And no one is truly black, white, red, or yellow. 
the colors associated with race. I was born in a very colorful family. My father is the son of a maid from whom he inherited an intense dark chocolate tone. He was adopted by my grandparents, the matriarch. My grandma has a porcelain skin and a cotton-like hair. And um, even if it's curious, the way that I describe my family, believe I learned that from kids. Because in the end, we teach kids black and white. If you ask a kid to describe a color, they will describe things looking around and with the things that they have around them. I hope people uh, learn what color is, how color is made, how you can manipulate color, but also how color is used in nature and how it's used in culture and how it's used in understanding our behaviors, our emotions, uh, how we feel every day. Colors have a lot to do with that too. By the way, if you plan to visit the American Museum of Natural History, check their website first to be sure they've reopened to the public. They're at amnh.org. And that's it for us. If you want to reach us at Simply Science, tv.cuny.edu. And you can also find us on Facebook and YouTube. I'm Barry Mitchell. Thanks for watching. See you next time on Simply Science. Ba -ba -dum -dum -dum. Ba -ba